The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Xamarin University Guest Lectures. We're really excited today to have Matthew Robbins. This is this is your second guest lecture. Is that right, Matthew? Uh, that's correct, Mo. It is. Sweet. Well, I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about himself, but let me brag on him just a little bit. Matthew's a Xamarin MVP. He's a Microsoft MVP, and he's also the creator of MFractor, which is a wonderful productivity add-in that everybody should check out. It's for Visual Studio Mac, and it's similar to ReSharper that you find on the Windows platform. And Matthew's going to explore today the dark art of Roslyn extensions and utilizing the Roslyn compiler platform to craft your own productivity add-ins. And so we're pretty excited about this. Go ahead and take it away, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, firstly, thanks everyone for joining me today. Uh, so as Mark said, I'm going into how to build uh, your own tooling based on Roslyn. Uh, this is more of a establishing the theory and foundations for using Roslyn kind of lecture. Uh, so it's broken up into two parts. I'll be talking about uh, the theory behind compilers and the, the knowledge that you need to know uh, in order to build your own extensions. Uh, and then also we'll be exploring a standalone console application uh, that's been built using the Roslyn compilation platform. Uh, so first of all, a little bit about me. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Matthew Robbins. I've been developing in the Xamarin space for roughly five years now. Uh, over the course of that, I eventually decided that I wanted to do something to improve the tooling, uh, and it led to me building a product called MFractor, uh, which is based on Roslyn, which is the foundation of all my Roslyn experience. So I'm a Microsoft and Xamarin MVP, uh, and basically I live and breathe Roslyn at the moment. So a little bit about my product and kind of how we use Roslyn in a day-to-day -day environment uh, to accomplish cool things. So MFractor is a mobile-first productivity tool for Visual Studio for Mac. Uh, you can compare it to kind of what ReSharper is on Windows, but specifically for Xamarin. Tom and I, we personally leverage Roslyn inside MFractor for the following things. Uh, we have a, an XML parser based on Roslyn uh, that enables us to convert XML to a full fidelity XML uh, DOM, and then perform semantic analysis on it uh, using the Roslyn APIs. Uh, from that XML, we can generate code uh, and refactor C-sharp, uh, and we can also figure out the relationship between pages and view models to add a whole bunch of navigation efficiencies as well. If you're interested, uh, check out www.mfractor.com. Uh, we have a, a light license and a professional license at $299 Australian dollars per year. Uh, and just if you have questions on the pricing or what it has to offer, uh, hit me up after the lecture. So an example of what you can accomplish Roslyn, uh, what you can use Roslyn to accomplish, uh, for us is to generate view models. So in Xamarin Forms, you have a XAML page and you data bind properties on a view model to properties on a control. So you can see that we have uh, a property that is being connected into, a, into a, uh, a property under control, and that needs an association uh, in, in the XAML page. So what we're able to do is figure out the type of the, the property under control, figure out the name of what the new property would be, and then generate a class with the full information from that. Uh, and that's using the, the Roslyn code generation APIs. So kind of before we get into the nitty gritty of things, this is how this lecture is gonna work. Uh, first of all, we're covering theory. So we'll be doing a, a 101 on, compiler, on, on compilers and what compilers do. Uh, then we'll talk about what Roslyn is and what its mission, what it aims to expose to end users. And then we'll go into the, the foundations for using Roslyn. So what, what are syntax trees and how do we work with them? Uh, and also, what is semantics, and what does semantics mean in the concept in the context of the compiler? Next, we'll dig into some sample code, uh, and we'll evaluate how to write a Roslyn app that's completely standalone from Visual Studio Windows or Visual Studio for Mac. So this includes how to create your own workspace, uh, loading code, and building a compilation. 
inspecting the syntax tree and semantic model uh, to do something useful, to transform it, so to generate our own code, and then also how to export that code into our own uh, .cs file. And then lastly, at the very end, I'll provide, it, provide you with resources and references that you can take away and start building uh, your own refactorings and diagnostics from the information that I've presented for today. So first of all, Compiler 101. A compiler essentially takes the meaning of one language and transforms it into another. Um, so it's essentially a translator but in, for a computer. So in the case of a computer, it turns source code that's readable by a person into machine code that's readable and executable by a machine. So it takes our lovely C-sharp Xamarin application and puts it into the final application that's deployed onto our device. So how does it do this? Uh, it has four distinct steps. So the first one, it converts the text files into syntax. Um, so something that the compiler can understand. Now this is called the parsing step. So it passes code into an abstract syntax tree, uh, which is abbreviated to AST for short. Next, it needs to load and build relational symbol data. Uh, so this is the semantic model of all the symbols inside a compilation. So what's described? What, what does the compiler know? Nextly, it needs to associate what it knows, so the symbol information, to the syntax that it passed in in step one. This is called the binding step. So it binds symbols to syntax in, into a bound tree. And lastly, it generates code. Uh, this is called emitting. So it emits code that can be executed. In human terms, so in human terms, we could uh, think of this as listening and then writing. So the parser is our ear listening for language uh, and storing that uh, in a sentence form in our own memory. Next, the semantic model is us loading up our memories. So what do we know uh, that we can reference with what we've heard? Next, the binding step can be thought of as thinking. So what do we know and what, what have we listened to and what's the meaning behind that? ready for us to action some, to do something against. And then lastly, with what we've heard and what we understand, we can then emit. So we could transform what we've heard and what we know into say an essay or something else. In terms of a actual compiler, this is broken into the passing step, uh, the symbol step, so where it understands the symbol understands the symbol information in the source code we've, we've just described and also the assemblies that we reference in our projects, connecting using the, bind, the binder, and then finally exporting using the IL emitter. And these are essentially the steps that Roslyn takes. So it passes code, it loads what it knows, it connects what it knows to what it's understood, and then it emits machine code or IL. So the question here is, what do, what do compilers have to offer us and why do we actually care about their internals? Well, compilers, when they go through these series of steps, they gain a very, very deep insight into how source code works. So firstly, they can pass code into an abstract syntax tree. So they understand uh, at a, f a full fidelity level uh, what our code how our code's been described. Compilers can also load and understand semantic data. So they can import assemblies, they can infer from source code uh, what it means. They can also connect syntax to symbol information. So they can say that that expression means that. And because they can bind syntax to symbols, they can then understand code at a syntactic level, level so understanding and confirming that the grammar of the code is correct, uh, and at the semantic level, so is the meaning correct? And lastly, they can also generate code from what they understand. Unfortunately, 
compilers are a black box. So the machine code, so the source code that comes in, it vanishes into this little black box that then spits out machine code at the other end. So all these very, very useful things that a compiler does, uh, they're, they're transient. They're only in, in the lifetime of the compiler. Uh, and these are things that we could use as developers to build really effective tools. So on this, the mission of Roslyn uh, is to open up the compiler black box uh, to allow tools and users to share in the information that compilers build about our code. So Roslyn itself, uh, it's a compiler, but it's a series of APIs that are built on top of the compiler that expose the information that it, it builds to us. So initially we have this black box of the compiler with the parser, the symbol, um, the semantic model, the binder, and the IL emitter. But in terms of Roslyn, it expands it out into, uh, it exposes out each of those discrete steps into a series of APIs. So the parser becomes a syntax tree API that we can use to consume source code and generate a syntax tree. Uh, the symbol, symbol stage becomes a symbol, symbol API that we can use uh, to look up symbols. Uh, the binding pass becomes its own API where we can uh, analyze the flow of data through our source code. And the IL emitter becomes an API that we can use to generate IL code. And because we now have an API that's built on top of uh, the compiler pipeline, it enables complex tools to be built. So we can now do formatting, uh, an object browser, we can do auto completion and advanced refactorings because we now have this API uh, that exposes out the components of a compiler. So Roslyn is essentially a, a compiler, but it's more of a compilation and tooling platform um, that exposes out the compiler as a series of APIs. So from these compiler APIs, we have workspace, the workspace API that we can use to do things like code formatting, finding all the references of a symbol inside our project. Um, and then on top of that, we can do really rich features such as refactorings and code fixes. And really, for the context of mFractor and how we use it, uh, this compiler API enables us to then take the features API and start building a whole bunch of other really, really useful things that can now stand alone from Visual Studio for Mac. Firstly, a really important concept in Roslyn is that uh, Roslyn itself is immutable. So when you make a change in Roslyn, you get a new, a new copy of the existing object that you made. Um, and this is really, really important because immutability uh, enables two really, really key things uh, that are very, very important in the compiler. So it enables thread safety. So the compiler can now be multi-threaded and it can reference symbols uh, and syntax without worrying about the read and writes of other threads. Uh, and this immutability uh, also enables performance. So because it's thread safe, it doesn't need to take locks when it's reading or writing data. Uh, and so you can get massive concurrency uh, and it made, makes Roslyn itself blazing fast. There's only one exception to this. The only object in Roslyn that isn't immutable uh, is the workspace itself. So the workspace is the environment that you're operating in. So for Visual Studio for Mac, um, the workspace is, is essentially Visual Studio for Mac. An example of how this immutability works uh, is that say we have a, class, a piece of class declaration syntax. If we wanted to add an attribute to it, uh, we don't, uh, when we add it, we call the add attributes list uh, method, and then we take a new copy of the syntax that's been transformed. So this original class declaration syntax, that won't be, that won't have the new attribute. It propagates into a new object uh, that now has the attributes. So this is really, really important to bear in mind when you're working with Roslyn, because you might have a document or a syntax tree that you inject code into and you don't take the result 
to operate against, and then you wonder why the code hasn't hasn't been created. Well, it's because the the original object doesn't isn't mutated; it's copied with the mutated results. So the first, so the two really really important concepts that we need to cover today uh, is the idea of syntax and also semantics. So syntax is the lexical and syntactic structure of source code. So that's code as it literally appears. It's uh, the grammar and the structure of the code itself, uh, so to speak. Um, and next, the semantics is the relationship of symbols in the source code. So it's what connects um, syntax in document A to a class declaration in document B. So syntax trees are a, they're basically a snapshot of your source code as a tree. If you've ever worked with um, HTML and you, you've used the document object model, so the DOM, um, that is essentially a syntax tree. Uh, and that's essentially what Roslyn will generate from your C-sharp code. So a, a, a big tree that you can operate against uh, to perform operations and analysis. Uh, this this is commonly referred to as a syntax tree, an abstract syntax tree or an AST. So if you hear me from now on referring to a syntax tree as an AST, uh, it's, it's interchangeable and I'm referring to a syntax tree. And now a syntax tree defines the structure of a compilation unit. Uh, so a compilation unit uh, it could be a source code document, so it could be one of your .cs files, but Roslyn doesn't really discriminate because of the way that the platform has been built. It could also be a code fragment that you've declared in a REPL. So if you've used, say, um, the REPL for building UI tests, you could declare a small code fragment. Uh, that could be its own compilation unit in itself. And syntax tree trees, they have three very, very important properties. So first of all, a syntax tree is full fidelity. So that means that the code file that you provide uh, into the parser that then generates the, the AST, it, it captures all the information about that code file. So it's not just the namespaces, the syntax, um, you, you know, your, your expressions. It's also the white space that encapture, um, that's included and separates all the components of your source code. And that white space uh, and seemingly trivial information is really, really important because it makes Roslyn um, syntax trees completely round trippable. So what this means is if you make a syntax tree and then you call dot to string on that syntax tree, it will generate the exact same code as what you passed in. So if you did a diff on those two code segments, so what went in and what went out, they will be exactly the same. And lastly, syntax trees, like the rest of Roslyn, are completely immutable. So when you make a change against the syntax tree, um, you get a copy of the syntax tree itself rather than mutating the existing tree. Uh, and that enables you know, performance and thread safety and all those lovely things that we desire as software developers. So how is a syntax tree composed? It consists of several discrete components. Now the first one is a syntax node. So that is a syntactic construct like a member declaration variable or an expression. Um, so it's basically a chunk of source code in itself. Uh, for example, an entire class declaration would be, a P, would be a class declaration syntax node that has multiple children. Uh, syntax nodes are never leafs in themselves. They, uh, they're composed of syntax trivia um, and syntax token, tokens. In terms of the actual API, uh, the foundational API for syntax node um, is the syntax node class in Roslyn. Uh, next, we have the idea of a syntax token. So this is the smallest syntax piece, the smallest, pieces of syntax 
inside Roslyn itself. Um, so this might be, if you have a string literal, this would be the content inside the string literal. In the Roslyn API, these are declared as the class syntax node. Uh, next in the structure of the syntax tree itself, you have the idea of a syntax trivia. So these are, uh, this is segments of code that's mostly insignificant in meaning, um, but there's, it's essential for having a full fidelity uh, syntax tree. So syntax trivia would include things like whitespace. So while whitespace isn't important um, for the meaning of the code, if we want to make you know, what comes in and being able to create the same thing on the way out, you need that, that white space uh, so that you don't screw up people's source code. Uh, it also includes things like comments and preprocessor directives. Uh, the next component of the syntax tree is the text span. So Roslyn uh, describes the location of a syntax fragment using this text span object. And rather than being, uh, it's, it's, well, it's declared as an offset in the length. So how far into your source code um, is this particular segment of code and how long is the source code? So for reasons of efficiency and um, just making it easy to work with, uh, it prefer, Roslyn uses a text span rather than line and column information. It's a bit out of scope why a line and column uh, is not the most eff effective way to store um, the location of information. Uh, but it causes problems in the, in the long run, and ultimately a text span is the better way of representing data, uh, the location of data. Uh, and then lastly, we have the concept of a kind. So everything in, from syntax trivia to tokens to nodes, they have their own kind. So this is a raw, what's known as a raw kind. Um, it's an integer, so an int32, that represents the exact language element in the AST. So every component of the syntax tree. So say like a member declaration expression or a string literal, literal a string literal itself, that has its own unique number uh, that you can use to reference uh, what that syntax element is declared as. In terms of how a syntax tree looks, we have this regex match expression here. If we were to represent that, represent that into a syntax tree, uh, we have our base inv invocation expression uh, and then each component, so that regex, the, the member call, and then the arguments, they're all broken down into uh, syntax nodes, syntax tokens, and then finally white space trivia. So if we're looking at the arguments list, for instance, that syntax node uh, is what's known as the argument list syntax node. And that's composed of its own syntax tree. If we keep breaking that down, uh, we can find that the first string literal expression uh, encapsulates a syntax token as its leaf. Um, so that is just the, the literal value that's declared in the source code with no meaning behind it. And then finally, to ensure full fidelity, uh, we have our white space trivia. So that's what separates our comma from our second argument. And using that white space trivia, we could call dot the string on arguments list and generate the exact same thing that one what went in. Next up is compilation. So a compilation is everything that you need to compile your source code. Uh, this includes all the assemblies that are referenced by your project itself. It's the compiler option, so the, the flags that control, you know, what's included and what's excluded, how the compiler should behave. And then all the symbol information that's been derived from your source code file. So figuring out that class declaration syntax, uh, the symbol information that gets, that gets pulled out of that. In a way, you can think of a compilation, though, as a big database of symbols. So much like the reflection API, we can use the compilation to ask questions about the symbol information in our source code. And when we're asking these questions, we use something called the semantic model. 
So the semantic model, it defines the relationship of symbols, so what's declared in the compilation, uh, to syntax in our syntax trees. So given that piece of syntax, so the class declaration syntax, what does it map to as a symbol? Now this includes uh, external ref assembly references as well. So the semantic model has visibility, not just within the source code that's been passed, but also the assemblies and external uh, symbol sources that you've defined. Using the semantic model, we can discover a whole bunch of very, very useful things about uh, our source code. Essentially, we can ask questions about our syntax. So we could go, given a syntax node, what is the symbol that, that is referenced by that syntax node? Uh, what is the result of an expression? So we could use the semantic model to, to ask, uh, given that uh, variable assignment, what's the type that's coming out of it? Uh, we can use it to derive the source, co source location of the symbols. And that's really just they found uh, a few examples of what we can do. So there's much, much more beyond that. To get our semantic model, uh, we can retrieve it by providing a syntax tree into a compilation. So in this example, we have our compilation. We call the method get semantic model and we provide a syntax tree. And as a result, we get a semantic model out. It's important to understand that a semantic model has a one-to-one -one relationship with a syntax tree. So one semantic model describes the relational information about that particular syntax tree. So it doesn't map vice versa to other syntax trees. It just declares how to map that syntax out into the compilation to look up uh, information that we need. Now the final component of the semantics section uh, is the symbols API. So a symbol itself is a distinct element in the compilation. So this could be, for instance, a type, it could be a method, or it could be a property on that type. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's just a symbol that is within the solution itself. In a way, the Symbols API can be thought of as being very, very similar to the CLI Reflection API, um, except it's much, 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 much richer than the CLI Reflection API. Another important aspect of the Symbols API uh, is that all symbols, regardless of their original location, um, they share the same API. So the symbols that are defined in our own source code, so the class declarations, the method declarations, uh, it uses the same uh, API uh, as the symbols that get imported from our metadata. So a class ex declared externally in an assembly uh, would be an iNamed type symbol, and then a class declared internally in our source code would also be an iNamed type symbol. So there's no differentiation between where they originated. And we access symbols through the semantic model. Uh, from this, uh, all, all symbols share the same common API, um, base class API, which is iSymbol. So let's go back to this regex match expression that we had at the start. If we have our, our syntax tree like so, this simple member access expression, uh, that maps, if we were to pass that into uh, the semantic model, basically that maps the regex syntax token down here. It maps it to an iname type symbol if we ran that into the semantic model. And we could do that by doing the following. Uh, we could find out what the meta type name is for that first uh, component of our source code, so the first piece of syntax for our source code is, and then using the compilation, we can look up that meta type and return the iname type symbol for regex. Then after we have this iname type single symbol for regex, we can inspect the methods, the properties, uh, and then how else it relates out into our compilation. 
So now that we've kind of got all, all the theory covered, uh, let's talk about a practical example of this. So what do we, what can we actually make this stuff do? Uh, in our example, so in the example that I'm presenting today, I built a standalone application um, that demonstrates most all these all of these concepts, and it's a command line tool that can take a class declaration that derives from uh, system attribute, detect if it's missing uh, an attribute usage annotation, and then inject it and export the source code. So while this is standalone, it demonstrates some important concepts. Uh, that is, how do I load up code? How do I inspect code for both syn syntax and semantic meaning? Um, that's the foundations for doing uh, code diagnostics. And then how do I transform existing code and generate new code? And that's the foundation for building your own code refactorings. I'm just going to paste in now the link to this. If you want to follow along, uh, I'm just going to open up the chat and paste the message in. So this is the GitHub repository that contains this source code. So if you'd like to uh, clone this or download it and follow along at home, uh, this is a really, really good way to uh, basically understand what I'm doing and explore and, and play. So this, this example it demonstrates a few key concepts. So that's how to set up a standalone compilation environment, how to load source code. So given you know, your .cs file, how do we get that into a compilation environment to generate a syntax tree and also load in the symbol information? How do we explore a syntax tree to locate a specific piece of syntax? How do we create new syntax from the syntax that we currently have? Um, how to modify existing syntax trees? And then finally, how to export that code? So this is a complete step, uh, a complete micro app uh, that, that demonstrates from setting up a standalone environment, loading code, transforming that code, and then exporting and actioning something upon that code. So I'm going to jump out now to Visual Studio for Mac. And if you've downloaded the example application, uh, you'll see here that we have a console application uh, called Introduction to Roslyn. And we'll just quickly go through kind of how this is all connected. So I'll just collapse down all the core components of this code. And we'll start from the start. So. Our first step would be to build a workspace. So that's set up the environment for the compilation itself. Um, so that we're ready to transform code and then export it out. The second step will be to retrieve the state of the compilation. So that will be how do we load, how do we retrieve the compilation itself? How do we get the syntax tree? And how do we get the semantic model for that syntax tree? Uh, the third step is how do we explore through the code that we've loaded to locate something of meaning. Uh, next, in step four, we'll explore how do we generate code and then mutate that existing syntax tree. And then lastly, how do we write out that code? So the code that we've transformed in step four, how do we, how do we export that um, to disk? So in this example, what we're doing is under resources, we have a code file that's attached um, as an embedded resource, just for convenience, uh, that derives, so it's a class declaration that derives from system.attribute. However, it's missing a system attribute usage annotation that describes how the attribute could be used. So if we wanted to make a, we could take this source code um, that we're using in our program today and then make a refactoring from it if you wanted to. But basically this is the code that we'll be loading up into our project. So I'll close that down and we'll get started and talk about how do we build a workspace.
So a workspace, it's basically the environment that your compilation is operating in. So the workspace could be the compiler itself. Uh, it could be Visual Studio for Mac. It could be um, Visual Studio Windows. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's just, you know, the workbench that the compiler is working on. There's a variety of different workspaces as well. So in this one, we're using an ad hoc workspaces, which is something that we're just building up on our own. Um, so we can just kind of inject solutions and projects and documents. Uh, it, it's it's an empty template, so to speak. It's a clean slate. Um, however, there's also a MS Build workspace that you can use to load in MS Build documents, and it will resolve and, and build the compilation from a solution. Um, and Visual Studio for Mac and Visual Studio Windows, they also have their own uh, Visual, special Visual Studio workspace that you can use. So the first step that we do, um, given our workspace that we've created, so our ad hoc workspace, our clean slate, we want to add a solution. So we can do that pretty simply by calling the add solution and then taking the result of the solution. Um, from that, we can add a project. So we're just making a project called my, my code base and putting that project into its own uh, variable that we've defined up here at the top in a static variable. Uh, next, we need some metadata information that we can use inside our compilation. So there's three very, very core, so there's three three key assemblies that most applications will be using. So MS Core Lib, uh, system and system.core. In this case, the way we load up these assemblies, it's a bit of a trick, but I'm just pulling those three assemblies from the current app domain. And then we can add them to our current project through the method add metadata reference. Now you'll notice here that what I'm doing is that each time that I've done a add metadata reference, this project here, I need to take the same copy of it to reuse again. So remember how I said at the start that Roslyn is immutable? Every time I change that project, a new copy with the changes are generated that I need to operate from then on with. Um, and it's the same with, with the solution. So the project, when it's changed, will have a new solution uh, parent object. So I need to propagate those changes back up. Um, so I need to set the top level solution with the new project. Uh, next, I want to make my own, I want to load some source code. So here I'm just reading in uh, that resource content and reading in as source code. So that will load uh, this source code under my custom attribute and it will load it into uh, a string. Given that string, I can then very, very simply call the method add document on the project, uh, give it a file name and the code that I want and it will do everything for me. So it'll pass that code into a syntax tree um, and it will also consume and load its symbols into the compilation and semantic model. And again, because our projects are immutable, it returns a document, but the document will have a new copy of the parent project and then the parent solution. So I need to propagate those back up into um, my existing variables. So the project needs to go back into the project. The the solution for that project needs to get back into the solution. And then finally, I need to mutate the top level workspace. And remember how the workspace is the only thing that's immutable in Roslyn. I need to commit those changes back into the workspace. Okay, so we've built up our workspace. So now we have something that we can operate against and do something meaningful. Before we start doing anything meaningful, we need to get the basic state of our source code. Um, so this is the environment that we're going to start transforming syntax and doing some analysis against. So we can eas quite easily grab the compilation by calling project.getCompilationAsync. Uh, because I don't want to use any concurrency in this application, I'm just doing dot result. Um, but there's no reason that you can't await uh, for 
for you know better th concurrency. Um, from that compilation, well, sorry, the next step is from the document we've declared, we can then grab the syntax tree. So that will give us the full fidelity uh, version of this my custom attribute class uh, as a syntax tree. And then lastly, from that syntax tree, we use the method get semantic model on our projects compilation to retrieve the semantic model uh, so that we can inspect the symbol information about our syntax um, to symbols. After that, we want to do something useful. Uh, in our case, we want to locate this first class declaration uh, item here. So that public class, my custom attribute, we want to inspect through our source code um, and locate that class declaration. In Roslyn, you have a special class called a syntax walker that can accomplish this. So for me, I've made a new class syntax declaration walker that can inspect through the syntax tree. Uh, so if I jump to that, uh, you can see here that I've made this class declaration syntax walker. I've derived from syntax walker and I can use the method visit uh, defined down here to walk through the syntax tree. So first of all, when I provide the top level node for the document, I, I get a compilation unit syntax. So that's a, a document-wide syntax node. So if you picture it, it's this entire document, uh, including all the using statements and the namespace, namespaces as well. So because we know it's a compilation unit, we know we want to visit that. So we call the visit uh, on the base. That will take us into either the using, the using syntax nodes or the namespace syntax nodes. When we hit a namespace syntax, we know the classes are, can be declared inside namespaces. So then we want to visit the namespace. And then finally, we want to terminate on the first class declaration syntax that we find. Um, so if, if the node is a class declaration syntax, we assign that to our class declaration variable and we don't call visit to end the visiting, uh, end the walking of the syntax tree. After that, uh, now that the walker has found a class declaration, uh, we can do some cool stuff. So we could check that that class declaration has a base class list by looking at the base list. Uh, if it does, then we want to check if it's a system attribute. So to make sure that things are matched up one to one, so checking that the actual base class declared is a system.attribute, we can call compilation.get type by meta name uh, and provide it in the fully qualified .NET type. So that would be much like if I declared it in my own source code as system.attribute.attribute or system attribute. Uh, and it will retrieve the iname type symbol for that. So if I hover over the var, you can see here that it's an iname type symbol. Um, and I can use that to query the property and the member information about that system.attribute type. Now the steps that I'm doing here, this is very, very similar to what I would do in a custom code diagnostic in Amfractor. The same, con the same concepts apply. Uh, you get given a piece of syntax that you want to inspect. Basically, you eliminate ver uh, eliminate conditions. So you eliminate the diagnostic based on uh, failing conditions until you eventually arrive at a at some meaning that you've described. So next up, from that attribute type, I am looking at all the base class types that that class declaration syntax declares. So if I refer back to my custom attribute, what I've grabbed out is this component here. So from the colon, uh, it gives me the system.attribute as well as anything else that's been declared. So if I, if I declared like an implementation for my interface here, that would also come into the base list declarations. Uh, 
Uh, and from that, I continue walking through, grabbing the type information for each of those simple base type uh, syntax. And then I want to compare it against that existing attribute type. And I have a helper method in MFractor called system, simple helper dot derives from. And that will compare a left hand uh, type to a right hand type to see if it derives from the right hand type. Um, if you want to look into that code, that's under the symbol helper class. And it has just a bit of code that uh, checks if the uh, the derivation is valid. After I've located a candidate class declaration syntax, so a a piece of uh, so a, a custom attribute that derives from system dot attribute, I can then store that. I'll then store that into my class declaration syntax here, and we're going to use this in a second to transform and add an annotation to it. So I'll just close down the class decoration syntax and we'll go into the fun step. So the steps that we are now generating new syntax. So first things first, to, before we need, before we start generating syntax uh, and transforming an existing syntax tree, we need to get something that we can operate on. So we, let's get the existing root of the current syntax tree and put that into a temporary variable. And we'll use this, um, we'll, we'll be mutating this in a, in a second. So now we wanna make uh, a system.attribute uh, usage annotation that we can uh, attack on, we can tack on to our existing class generation, our class declaration. So the way that we do this is through a syntax factory. Um, in my case, I wrap the syntax factories with helper methods, um, or in the case of mFractor, we have the concept of, of an I code generator, so that things can be reused, um, and it's all composable. But the basic idea is this. Roslyn provides a class called the syntax factory. Um, the syntax factory has a lot of helper methods. So it, it's, it's a factory, so it has methods that we can compose. So if I do syntax factory, uh, dot. You'll see here that it has many, many, many um, methods that generate a specific type of syntax. So the block syntax, uh, that would generate an expression body, for instance. Uh, the comment would create a new comment syntax trivia. Uh, and in our case, we can invoke the syntax factory dot attributes list to build out an attribute list that we can put onto a class declaration. Now, you can see here, this is quite a handful to make. So for me to just make a system, a simple, um, you know, system dot attribute usage, attribute targets dot class, uh, declaration. So that's a fairly small line of code. Um, just to do that, I've got roughly 20 lines of code to make that one piece of simple syntax. Um, there is a very, very simple way of getting this code generation. So up the top here, I've linked to this website called Roslyn Quota. So if I copy that, and then I'll swipe over to my browser again, I will make a new tab and paste in Roslyn Quota. This is a really, really, really handy online web service that you can use to pass in any kind of source code that you want. And Roslyn Quota will generate the syntax factory invocations for it. So if I wanna see the syntax factory uh, invocation, so the, the leading syntax factory uh, call, I'm just gonna uncheck, do not require using static uh, syntax factory. And then if I wanted to test out, how do I generate a method? So public void my method uh, with a string of my string and it has a default value of my default value. And then say it throws a new exception. 
when I click get Roslyn API calls to generate this code, it will consume this source code deco like this source code I provided to it. And after a short time of figuring out how to, you know, what to do with it, I now have a full syntax factory invocation uh, that I can use to generate this exact source code. Uh, and that's really, really useful because when you want to generate source code, uh, learning how to use the syntax factory and exploring it is quite painful. So this this service is is a really, really easy way to take an idea in your head and make the, the syntax factory for you. Um, and that's essentially all that I've done here to make the system attributes uh, annotation. Um, so from that attribute list, uh, I can take my first class declaration and mutate it using add attributes list. And because I'm mutating uh, an existing piece of syntax, the first part, like the syntax that I'm operating against won't be changed because it's immutable. It'll generate a second copy, uh, which I've assigning into new syntax. So if I start up my program here, and I come into my debugger, if I hovered over the class declaration syntax, If I hover over the class declaration syntax, uh, I now see, I'll see that the existing one uh, has no attributes list. Uh, however, the new syntax, that does have an attributes list. Sorry, I just I clicked the wrong button there. I had to fight, uh, go to meeting for a little bit. Uh, but back on track. So the class declaration syntax itself, um, after I've called add, add attributes list, the attributes list itself on the original one remains intact. But the new syntax here, that now has our new attributes list syntax. So if I open that up and say I did, um, in here, uh, new syn in the watch new syntax attributes list, you can see that it has the full declaration uh, of that uh, new attribute. So this new attributes list that I created. After we have that new syntax, we need to take that root node and replace it with the new with the new class declaration. So we want to replace the class declaration. Um, that we've defined here with our new syntax that we generated from mutating our existing syntax. And then after that, uh, our new mutated root node, uh, again, that will be different to our, our first root node. So our existing root node will have uh, our members namespace, the, names, the namespace declaration uh, with our uh, class declaration syntax without our attribute. However, the new mutated root, if we go into the members, the namespace, then finally the members, uh, this new class will, then, will now have the attributes target. So you can see that each time that we change something, we have to take the copy and apply it back up into the parent. And then Lastly, because documents are also immutable, uh, we need to change the document with the new syntax root. So we will do dot syntax, dot with syntax root on the document and then take the change. And the important thing that I've just accidentally skipped is before that we before we commit that uh, new syntax root node um, back to the top level, we want to run the formatter against it. So the formatter will do things like normalizing the white space. Um, applying user formatting conventions. Um, it's really, really important for making sure that the source code that we've made uh, matches the expectations of what our end user would normally be making. 
um, and, and is in line with their project conventions. And now that we have some newly generated code, we can continue here. And because the syntax tree is full fidelity, generating the C sharp code is literally as simple as calling dot to string on the syntax tree. So if I continued, that syntax tree dot to string on the new code, uh, if I open that up and view it in the debugger, it matches the first batch of code that I provided in with all the white, the same white space information. So it's using the spaces that I prefer. Um, the indentation is all correct and it matches what was in my, my custom attribute originally. But all we've done is just injected this new attribute. And then because we have a string, we can just write it out to do this uh, by creating a file path and then providing the code that we want to write into the file path. And it's really just as simple as that. And now we can open that up in Atom. And we now have some newly transformed code. So all that stuff is, bas is the basics of how to put together your own tooling. So the fine class syntax, that demonstrates how we would walk through uh, and inspect code um, like what we do in a code diagnostic. The transform syntax, that's what we would do in a code refactoring. So we'll just jump back into the, into the lecture here. So all of we, all of what we've covered, that is really the foundation for building on from this um, and getting into what you need to do to build your own uh, code um, code tooling. So we can now write our own co code diagnostics because, because we know how to analyze code and inspect the state by looking at this fine class syntax method. Uh, if we just derive from the diagnostic analyzer class in Roslyn, um, now we can inspect for issues and annotate them in end source code. Uh, we can write code refactorings. Uh, because we've done transformation in the transform syntax and we've generated new syntax, um, that's the foundation for a refactoring. So we could derive from uh, the code refactoring provider in Roslyn and apply what we've just learned um, to make refactorings and transform code. And then putting this together, we can now start you know, making our own add-ins for Visual Studio for Windows based on Roslyn. Uh, we can also do our own add-ins for Visual Studio for Mac. And there's really so much more you can do, to this, do with this. Because Roslyn is a standalone compiler um, and it's a NuGet package, you can just, uh, like what I've done in this project here, this is just a console application, and all I've done is added a package reference uh, to Microsoft Code Analysis, um, which is the Roslyn compilation platform. And it's really just as simple as that. So you can make your own command line analyzers or command line code formatters uh, if you wanted to. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. <coughs> In terms of resources, um, to go from here, from this lecture. A really, really good place to start is in the GitHub Roslyn overview. Um, so if I, if I followed that link through, this is the repository for the Roslyn source code, and it's basically the readme um, for Roslyn. So if you explore through this, you can understand how everything gets pieced together. So, you know, what Roslyn's about, how to work with syntax, how, what, how to use the semantics and how to use workspaces. Uh, and this is the essential information that builds on top of what I've talked about today. Um, you can also learn to create your own code, code analyzer. So I've linked out to a, li to a link that describes how to write a, write a code, code diagnostic from scratch. Uh, if you want examples on how to write code fixes, uh, diagnostics and refactorings, there's an open source repository, repository called Roslinator. Uh, and this is 
a huge collection of analyzers and refactorings um, that's powered by Roslyn. And so here you can just inspect and understand how everything goes together. Uh, and it's a great example, a, a great uh, starting point for building your own analyzers and refactorings. Uh, again, Roslyn Quater. So if you want to uh, take source code that's in your head and transform it into a syntax factory, uh, Roslyn Quater is the way to do it. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to learn how to make add-ins for Visual Studio for Mac, I did a guest lecture about a year ago um, for Xamarin University that talked about how to build extensions for Xamarin Studio. Now, all these concepts, they still carry over to Visual Studio for Mac because its heritage is, for, is on Xamarin Studio. So if you want to start making um, complex tooling, kind of like kind of how mFractor has been built, this is a starting point for you to do that. So this building add-ins of Xamarin Studio repository. And that's the last of it. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. Uh, if anyone has questions. Uh, okay, so yeah, there's a few there. Uh, mostly on how to get, so it looks like that one was resolved. So if anyone does have questions, um, just jump in. Otherwise, weaving. Uh, yeah, in theory you can. Um, because you have that binding and emission step, so the IL emitter, uh, after the binding step, you'll basically have an IL code. Um, so you could take what's in the syntax tree and the semantic model and then uh, generate IL. I believe that Roslyn's also capable of loading IL. Uh, so yeah, in theory, that should definitely be possible. I don't know how to do it myself, um, but if you started from the Roslyn code, so you, if you looked at the binding APIs and the IL emitting APIs, that would give you the starting point for weaving. Uh, any more questions? Awesome, Matthew. Wow, thanks. That was great stuff. Um, I'll be honest, I think I'm going to have to go back and watch this again to get it all in my brain. <laughs> so um, thanks, everyone, for attending today's session. Uh, let us know what you think and what you'd like to see in upcoming guest lectures through the surveys. You should get an email shortly after we're done here today. Um, and we'll have the recording of this lecture up shortly. And make sure to check out Matthew's samples in his GitHub repo. And um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, everybody, I hope you all have a great day. And thank you again, Matthew, for presenting this. This was great. Um, no worries, Mark. Uh, so I've just noticed that yeah, I gave no context to what I answered before. Um, so the question was about, uh, can we use this for weaving? So just to, to backpedal a little bit, uh, Yes, you can use Roslyn for weaving. I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, um, but the starting point would be to look at the binding and emitting APIs. Yeah, and you might just want to describe or at least tell people for that have never heard that term before what it weaving is. Uh, okay, um, so it's based on the process of uh, given um, IL code, uh, modifying that IL code to do something a bit different. Um, so Ferdy, for instance, is a weaver that uh, well, has more, many different weavers. We use Ferdy in Xamarin Forms in, in particular um, to automatically implement I notify property change. So that's a weaver uh, that looks at um, property getter and setters, and it will weave in IL code for firing off the property change event. So that's essentially what a weaver is. It's, um, it's a transformation of IL code. Awesome. All right, thanks. It looks like the questions have kind of died down. So thank you again, Matthew. This was great stuff. We'll get we'll get the video up and, and we'll make sure to post a link to your GitHub samples as well. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.